distant planet, a spaceship spins out of control. Back on planet Earth, a stormy sea batters a floating crane. Two stunning sequences made possible with special effects techniques using miniature action models. Crafting models and miniatures is a fine art in itself, but photographing them to appear absolutely real on film is one of the toughest challenges in the movie industry. Coming up, we'll meet the masters of action miniatures from Hollywood to Moscow. And we'll go to San Francisco in miniature with Forward Productions, a family business that sells spectacular scenes in small packages. On Movie Magic. In the romantic comedy Heart and Souls, four recently departed spirits find themselves suspended between this world and the next. To make this supernatural story believable, director Ron Underwood needs seamless special effects. And to get his movie off to a magical start, he's entrusted the opening shot to one of Hollywood's top specialty effects firms, Forward Productions, the home of two noted effects wizards, brothers Dennis and Robert Skotak. This guy's working on the railing here. We want to reposition the camera. And... Here in their Burbank, California studio, the Skotak brothers create action sequences so finely crafted and creatively photographed that audiences would hardly guess the scenes are actually happening in miniature. The Skotak's work includes such memorable moments as the exploding atmosphere processor in Aliens, a collapsing crane in the abyss, and the nuclear holocaust in Terminator 2. Three films for which the brothers shared Academy Awards for best visual effects. But the Skotax movie making career actually began in their boyhood home in Detroit. So we started out essentially doing little tabletop literature setups uh, when we were uh, probably five or six, seven years old. And our neighbors thought we were all crazy because they'd see us out in the backyard and hauling stuff out of the basement and building sets and shooting them at night with floodlights in the yard, that sort of thing. We did a couple of little 8 millimeter films, one of which was our version of the time machine. Uh, visual effects were just sort of uh, to extend what we could do with our meager dollars uh, into something that's a little bit more spectacular. Today, the brothers continue their lifelong filmmaking partnership. I would say that Dennis and I overlap a tremendous amount in our work. Uh, primarily, Dennis handles the photographic and the lighting and the look. I am very involved with the art direction, the design and concept of the shot, and the direction of all the action within that. The result of the brothers' longtime collaboration is a resourceful approach to movie making, a unique style that admirers have termed SCO technology. To us, our approach to doing special effects is so logical that I don't see any other way of doing it. It's an extension of what we would have done on a low budget if we were doing it ourselves in, say, an 8mm. It's just you carry it further. In modern effects work, many filmmakers opt to shoot scenes as separate elements that are later composited into a single image. For example, in this television commercial directed by Ridley Scott, the Skotax utilized miniatures computer-generated images, and live-action footage. When these individual elements are digitally combined, the results are devastating. But the Skotax first achieved prominence by helping to revive an older, more traditional approach. This technique is known as in-camera because the complete effect is achieved by photographing all of the elements at one time using a single camera, or by photographing multiple exposures on a single strip of film negative. We do a lot of things in camera so that we can show to the director, to the producer, whoever, the art director, what the final shot would look like much faster. And there's less ambiguity about it. I mean, it's all there, you can see it, and they really love it. And we do too, because it's very direct. You don't, you're not surprised later on. 
such effects-driven films as Darkman, Tremors, and Bram Stoker's Dracula have featured shots created in camera by the Skotax. For Terminator 2, they utilize both traditional and cutting-edge techniques to realize director James Cameron's vision of a nuclear nightmare. And they know what's going to make a great shot from computer-generated imagery of the collapsing buildings and the shockwave propagating across the city to just good old-fashioned run the cameras up to 120 frames and blow it up, miniature photography. They didn't just create the storyboards, they went beyond the storyboards to create a really memorable sequence. The Los Angeles freeway shots demanded special attention to detail. It was a very large miniature, required a lot of force, a lot of air cannons to blow these vehicles away. The vehicles were actually being pulled by cable. In addition to that, there were some palm trees that get blown over, and those were pulled by cables. The Skotax believe that the long setup time required for creating shots in camera pays off with a cleaner, more realistic image. That's the way real life occurs. In a sense, when you're looking at a shot that's done in camera, you're seeing it as an integrated image. There's no guesswork. In contrast to the overwhelming fury of T2's Judgment Day, the Skotax work in heart and souls will be much more subtle. The opening scene will present an aerial view of San Francisco circa 1959. In setting up these opening shots of uh, San Francisco, the flyover, we wanted to create this majestic, uh, almost heavenly view of the earth, almost like here's God looking down, uh, now starting to focus on particular characters in the scheme of life who have to live through these events. To create San Francisco in miniature, model makers handcraft 200 buildings out of plexiglass. They paint everything but the tiny windows black. Lights positioned underneath the set shine through the unpainted plexiglass, creating the illusion of sparkling sky rises. The challenge here is that we, to make the clouds look right, to make them feel like they really are clouds because they're actually polyester fiber fill. They're stuff that pillows are made out of. They work great as long as they don't droop, and one thing you can't have is a droopy cloud because it just doesn't happen in real life. A lot of what we were doing was being very careful in the planning of the look of the art direction and you know, creating little glints and uh, blinks of light over the city and clouds that came in just right and revealed parts of the city in a very magical kind of way. Once the Skotax complete this sequence, they begin work on another heavenly shot to close the movie. In the final scene, the film's two romantic leads, Robert Downey Jr. and Elizabeth Shue, are inside San Francisco's beautiful glass-walled conservatory. The shot has us seeing them embracing, and we pull up and away from the window of the conservatory and crane up and go up into the sky. Since filming this shot at the real conservatory isn't practical, the forward model makers build a one-quarter scale replica of the building's roof. Lights on. To photograph this shot in camera, the Skotax use a process called rear screen projection. A film projector beams footage of the young couple onto a screen placed behind the model conservatory. A computer-controlled camera films the projected pictures through the glass roof, gradually pulling away to tilt up at the night sky. Rear screen projection is an old technique. It presents a challenge in that it has to look real. In the old days, you'd see somebody standing in front of a projection. You could, you could tell what it was. Today, by doing proper lighting to the screen, you can make this look very believable. For this rear projection shot, the SCOTAC team mounts the conservatory model on its side. This allows for an easier setup of a shot that will encompass 180 degrees. Standing in for the night sky is a front screen dotted with stars made of reflective tape. Every one of those is hand glued on there. It's front screen material, it's incredibly reflective, so when you're online with it, it creates a beautiful starry nighttime sky. Previously shot footage of the couple is carefully projected onto the appropriate spot. Then, to help mask the cut between the live action footage and the miniature shot, Dennis adds an artistic touch. Which is sort of a whitewash over all the windows. It lets us see a little bit through, but not too much. Then we pull back out of the window, we see them dancing. We just see them through a haze of glass. With a combination of live action footage projected on a rear screen, the miniature model conservatory, 
and a front screen night sky, the Skotaks give this heartwarming story a fairy tale ending, a finale that invites moviegoers to wish upon a star. Filmmakers used special effects to explore the realms of space when visions of rocket ships were pure fantasy. But some of the most groundbreaking science fiction films were created far from the Hollywood mainstream. In the late 1950s, Russian filmmakers produced several visually exciting space travel movies. Later, recuts of these films were shown in the United States under such fanciful titles as Queen of Blood and Voyage to the Planet of Prehistoric Women. Within these movies uh, were some remarkable special effects and they were of an imaginative level and a creative level that was uh, unique. The effect scenes for these science fiction films greatly impressed the young Skotaks. Robert began a long distance quest to find the Russian artists and learn their trade secrets. I found that uh, there were primarily two people whose films I was seeing. I was seeing the work of a man named Pavel Klushantsev and, a, and another man by the name of Mikhail Karyukov. To hear the true story of these pioneering effects artists, Robert traveled to the former Soviet Union in 1992. There he met the filmmakers responsible for creating the images that had fueled his imagination. It was a very warm, very wonderful meeting and we immediately launched into millions of questions about each other's work and how we uh, had similarities and vast differences. The most difficult thing turned out to be showing zero gravity because the suspension ropes interfered with the movement of the suspended person. One way we did it wasn't even to use thin wires to suspend the actor, but to use thick steel cables. We shot him from a lower angle. In other words, the cables were hidden by the actor's body. I found it interesting that some of the uh, techniques that were used in 2001, supposedly for the first time, had actually been employed by uh, Pavel Klushantsev in the early 50s. Sadly, the achievements of Pavel and Mikhail have been largely ignored, even in their own country. Touched by the Americans' appreciation, the Russians gave the Skotaks these priceless production photos, records of a nearly forgotten film era. They were overwhelmed with the fact that their films had been shown in the West, that anybody even knew who they were, and I said, I got a number of people uh, know your work and are very impressed by it. You should know that uh, your work will, will live on. The Skotak's intimate knowledge of space films proved invaluable when they oversaw the visual effects for aliens. For one heart-stopping shot, Dennis and Robert used a combination of miniatures and rear screen projection to create the illusion of a shuttlecraft crashing on a distant planet. Among the difficulties you'll, you'll find in a setup like the dropship crash is how to give a sense of weight. What we did was dress the set with uh, ash and fuller's earth and various par particulate matter that would scatter and set up clouds of dust and set bits and pieces flying at the camera. Many of the film's action scenes were created in camera, including some using this radio-controlled armored personnel carrier. Our miniature, which was uh, roughly five feet long, the only way we'd get to go fast enough was to actually build the set as a downhill slope. So the cameraman was ahead of it as it was going down the hill, and it was coming at him, and he was rolling backwards with gravity on a dolly, and the thing was coming right at him. We're frustrated in that ultimately these, these images are not three-dimensional. We try to break through that barrier to give the sense that the stuff is coming off the screen. Eye-popping photography captured another memorable Skotak model, the bat ski boat in Batman Returns. You had to build a, uh, a tunnel 120 feet long in miniature, quarter-scale tunnel on our stage, seal it, uh, make it water, waterproof, and detail that entire length and create fog effects down the entire length that were uh, consistent and uh, didn't obscure the shot while the bat boat was pulled through the shot by an air motor at about 35, 40 miles an hour. Now an object that is five or six feet long, that's going 35 miles an hour, that has, has to come within an inch of the lens, actually gets fairly dangerous. Uh, our cameraman, he was wearing a motorcycle helmet and he wound up uh, just getting out of the way just in the nick of time as the bat boat would be coming by. 
Just as Soviet filmmakers influenced two brothers on the other side of the world, so are the Skotaks creating a body of work to inspire the next generation of effects artists. Effects artists carefully plan each shot using drawings called storyboards. As these storyboards illustrate, Heart and Souls begins with a dramatic bus crash. The filmmakers will use full-size buses for the before and after shots. But rather than stage an actual accident, director Ron Underwood is counting on SCO technology to create the image of a bus crashing through a guard railing. To begin, the SCO tax first make a video animatic, a rough test using cardboard cutouts for the models. What we have to do is get this bus to follow the path that the original bus did, full-size bus does, come up to this rail, break it properly, and then fly through the air and land in the right spot breaking the wires in the right place, doing all of the business that happened for real. Several technicians assist the Skotax in setting up the miniature San Francisco street and bridge. There's headlights, inside lights. Sandy Stewart wires the model bus with tiny lights to match the full-size vehicle, while Taylor Black assembles the pieces of rigid foam railing that will break apart when the bus crashes through. Right, I just want to know where the gap is underneath this pole. Okay, uh, to your left. Tom Seymour helps Dennis Skotak light the set. Okay, now this area, we're gonna have to make darker. Lighting in miniature is a, is a very, very key part to making it look believable. We place little pools of light. We put, we put a little light in one spot, another light in a little spot, and then we have to take camera flags camera and C-stands and cutting off areas of light so that we, we make it not only look interesting, but look believable. So if you move it to the left, we'll be happier. Forward's ace model builder, Jim Toller, oversees the installation of the 1 8 scale bus. The bus rides on a steel plate on the little track, which is being pulled by a cable that goes around a, uh, a pulley at the front of the bridge, and it goes all the way back and then up to the ceiling. It's connected to a bundle of sandbags. And those sandbags are connected to another trip release. So when that is pulled, the bags will drop and it'll pull the, you know, the chain reaction will pull the plate forward. When the trolley bus's cables break, a handheld grinder will create miniature sparks. As the team completes their work, Robert steps in to ensure the street will appear appropriately weathered. Dozens of minute details are checked in order to create a shot that is totally convincing. So when I say it'll be roll camera, A, B, smoke, just go ahead and put one on and put the other on. Because that'll get speed pretty quick. Once the bus is in motion, we don't stop rolling cameras. Right. There's nothing, yeah, whatever we, there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah. Even if the windows fall out or whatever, no yeah. matter what. Right. With everything in place, in case, filming problem, begins. Uh, roll camera. The first take immediately reveals an unanticipated problem. The shadow of the bus on the wall is showing how it hit, how it bounced. Lights can be reset to eliminate the shadow, but the bus's bouncing action will have to be concealed. A check of the models reveals some rebuilding time is necessary before a second take. But if we don't have to do an elaborate sky, then it's not a problem. The hours grow late. The SCOTAX will spend the night re-envisioning the shot. The next day, the forward team is back in action with some inventive ways to improve the bus crash. It was decided that we would try and block some of the action of the bus exiting with um, some foreground um, elements, which would be part of the, the shot. There'll be a parked car um, and a parking meter in front of it. Jim carves the meter body out of a rigid polyethylene foam and fabricates the glass piece out of plastic to quickly create a realistic miniature. The parking meter is positioned under a car fender to complete the shot. So I'm going to just take the whole thing down. Yeah. The car no longer looks like it's parked way over past the meter. All of the elements are finally ready for another take. This time, the shot is perfect. It was gone. After many hours of work, 
the forward team savors its success. So much more fun when it works. You know. <laughs> the addition of the car and the parking meter in the foreground actually helped the shot. It uh, gave it a more depth. A technical problem actually was, resulted in a, uh, an artistic improvement. The movie's director couldn't be more pleased. How to photograph the miniatures is the real key and where the Scotex are such masters is in terms of photographing and lighting miniatures in a realistic and beautiful way. After working uh, 17 or 18 or 19 or 20 hours or whatever it takes to get something done, it's so satisfying. We've solved all the problems that were unsolvable. It feels like, well, that was worth it all. And then the next challenge comes up and you begin to wonder, is it worth it all again? The, the real reward for us is much less something like an Oscar, but it's seeing a great shot on the screen and you know, knowing that it's going to be around for a number of years and a lot of people will appreciate it. Adding their own innovations to time-honored miniature effects, the Skotax have made unforgettable movie magic. the brothers shared Academy Awards for Best Visual Effects. But the Skotax movie-making career actually began in their boyhood home in Detroit. So we started out essentially doing little tabletop miniature setups uh, when we were uh, probably five or six, seven years old. And our neighbors thought we were all crazy because they'd see us out in the backyard and hauling stuff out of the basement and building sets and shooting them at night with floodlights in the yard, that sort of thing. We did a couple of little 8mm films, one of which was our version of the time machine. Uh, visual effects were just sort of uh, to extend what we could do with our meager dollars uh, into something that's a little bit more spectacular. Today, the brothers continue their lifelong filmmaking partnership. I would say that Dennis and I overlap a tremendous amount. A family business that sells spectacular scenes in small packages on Movie Magic. In the romantic comedy Heart and Souls, four recently departed spirits find themselves suspended between this world and the next. To make this supernatural distant planet, a spaceship spins out of control. Run! Back on planet Earth, a stormy sea batters a floating crane. Two stunning sequences made possible with special effects techniques using miniature action models. Crafting models and miniatures is a fine art in itself, but photographing them to appear absolutely real on film is one of the toughest challenges in the movie industry. Coming up, we'll meet the masters of action miniatures from Hollywood to Moscow. And we'll go to San Francisco in miniature with forward production the story believable, director Ron Underwood needs seamless special effects. And to get his movie off to a magical start, he's entrusted the opening shot to one of Hollywood's top specialty effects firms, Forward Productions, the home of two noted effects wizards, brothers Dennis and Robert Skotak. Yeah, like this guy's working on the railing here. We want to reposition the camera. And... Here in their Burbank, California studio, 
the Skotak brothers create action sequences so finely crafted and creatively photographed that audiences would hardly guess the scenes are actually happening in miniature. The Skotak's work includes such memorable moments as the exploding atmosphere processor in Aliens, a collapsing crane in the abyss, and the nuclear holocaust in Terminator 2. Three films found in our work, uh, primarily Dennis handles the photographic and the lighting and the look. I am very involved with the art direction, the design and concept of the shot, and the direction of all the action within that. The result of the brothers' long-time collaboration is a resourceful approach to movie making, a unique style that admirers have termed SCO technology. To us, our approach to doing special effects is so logical that I don't see any other way of doing it. It's an extension of what we would have done on a low budget if we were doing it ourselves in, say, an 8mm. It's just you carry it further. In modern effects work, many filmmakers opt to shoot scenes as separate elements that are later composited into a single image. For example, in this television commercial directed by Ridley Scott,